In this video, my goal is to explain why Fourier series works and how we can calculate Fourier series. So where, where, where the coefficients come from. And the way that I'm going to do this is by drawing parallels between Fourier series and linear algebra. So uh, most of this video is just going to be revealing linear algebra. So uh, going through a couple examples there to maybe refresh your memory of uh, some things you may have learned in linear algebra but may not remember. Uh, and then in the second half of the video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift to Fourier series and I'm going to show the parallels between linear algebra and Fourier series and show how using the exact same techniques in linear algebra, uh, we can study and uh, learn about Fourier series. So let's get started. We know in linear algebra that if we have some vector, say, 2, 3, uh, we know that we can expand this vector in terms of some basis vectors. So we know that this vector 2, 3 can be expressed as some constant times this vector 1, 0 plus some constant times this vector 0, 1. And so uh, we, we're, we're saying that this, this, this vector right here, this vector 2, 3, we can expand this in terms of two basis vectors, uh, which we'll, we'll call E1 for 1, 0 and e2 for 0, 1. And now that we've expanded in terms of basis vectors, we just need to solve for a and b, and we, you know, we, we, can, we can do that by the best method inspection, and we see that a is 2 and b is 3. Um, but, you know, we may not always be dealing with a, a case this easy. You know, maybe, maybe these, these aren't, this isn't a two-dimensional vector, but a ten-dimensional vector, and, and maybe these, these basis vectors aren't so clean, so we want to develop a more general, more general way of of determining what these coefficients a and b are. And so the special trick that I'm going to use here, really the, the, the core idea behind the method uh, is I'm going to use a special feature of our basis vectors. And that, that special feature is that the dot product of E1 with E1 is equal to one. The dot product of E2 with E2 is equal to one. But the dot product of E1 with E2 is equal to zero, right? Because we have, we have no overlap between these two vectors. And so how does that help us in this case? Well, in this case, we can do the following trick. We can say, if we want to find out what this coefficient A is, we can take the dot product of both sides with E1. So what happens if we do that? So we have... We have e1 dotted into 2, 3 equal to, well, what do we have here? We have the constant a, and then e1 dotted into this basis vector, which is e1, plus b times e1 dotted into this basis vector, which is e2. And what do we see? We see that this right here is just going to be equal to 1. Uh, this right here equal to 0. And so what we're left with then, what we're left with then is e1 dot this vector, which is 2, is equal to a. And we can do the exact same thing with e2. So instead of instead of dotting, instead of taking the dot product of both sides with e1, we can take the dot product of both sides with e2. And it's easy to see that in that case, we'll get that b is equal to 3. So that was an easy case. We, we really didn't even need to do this sort of extra complicated step of just of, of multiplying through by uh, these basis vectors because you know we, we can read off the answer by I. Uh, but let's consider a, a slightly more, just a slightly more complicated case. So let's, let's maybe consider if we wanted to write this vector 2, 3 in terms of some new base, basis vectors. So instead of... Uh, 1, 0, and 0, 1. Maybe we want to express it in terms of 1, minus 1, and 1, 1. So in this case, let's think about our machinery again. So in this case, we have E1 is equal to 1, minus 1, and we have E2 is equal to 1, 1. And we also have that E1 dotted into E1 well, this is this is two now, right? Because we have one times minus one times minus one, so two. Uh, same thing for e two. So e two dotted into e two. That's going to give us two. 
Um, but we still have the fact that these are orthogonal. So orthogonal meaning that their dot product, the dot product between E1 and E2 is equal to zero. So the, the, these vectors are orthogonal, but they're not normalized. So, so their length or their dot product with themselves is not equal to one. Okay, um, so how do we proceed from here? Well, let's take the dot product of both sides with E1. So uh, E1 dotted into this vector two, three is equal to A. And then what do we have? We have E1 dot E1 again plus B times E1 dot E2. We know from our orthogonality relations here that this is equal to zero. This is equal to two. So let's write this on another line. So we have uh, this is equal to two times a, and then e1 dotted into this vector, uh, you get minus one. And so we see then that a is equal to minus one half. And you can repeat this process for b, and what you find is that b is equal to five halves. Five halves. And, and just to double check, so if b is five halves and a is minus one half, then our top component is going to be equal to two, and our bottom component is going to be equal to three. Perfect. Yeah, exactly, exactly what we expect. And so what have we seen here? We've seen that if we have some vector that we want to write in terms of some basis vectors, well, we have a, a generalized way of doing that. And the way that we do that, so I'll, I'll write it down here, we say that if we have some vector v that we can express in terms of basis vectors like this, so some constant times the first basis vector times some constant or plus some constant times the second basis vector, and, and maybe we, we go off into you know many more dimensions, but here I'll just do it for two. Uh, in this case, we can solve for these coefficients a and b, a and b, like this. If, if e1 and e2 are orthogonal, then we say that a is equal to e1 dot v divided by e1 dot e1, and b is equal to e2 dot v divided by e2 dot e2. And so this is this is exactly what we see in, in this example right here, right? Because what we did was we, we, we took the dot product of both sides with e1. And so we had e1 times our vector v here. And then everything on the right hand side went to zero, except for this one term, which had the same basis vector. And so we, we would we just divide over uh, this length, this e1 dot e1, and, that, and then we get a. Okay, that's fine. We see how this works for linear algebra. It's it's fairly straightforward, albeit, you know, it seems a little unnecessary in this case. Um, but how does this connect to Fourier series? Well, the idea is that this left-hand side here, this vector, is our, our function that we're trying to expand in terms of Fourier series. And the right-hand side is the Fourier series itself with, with the basis vectors. And so, so for Fourier series, this is constant plus a1 times cosine of x plus a2 cosine of 2x plus more cosine terms plus b1 sine of x plus b2 sine of 2x plus all the rest of the sine terms. And so in this case, what we want to do in Fourier series is that we want to solve for these coefficients a1, a2, and b1, b2, you know, all the way out through all the trig terms. And the basis functions that we have are these, they're, they're sines and cosines. And so how do we solve for the coefficients then? Well, we, we repeat the exact same thing that we did in this linear algebra case. So in the linear algebra case, what we did was we used the fact that the basis functions are orthogonal so we use the fact that these e1s and these e2s uh, are only non-zero when they're with each other. And we use that trick in order to isolate the constant terms. And so that way we could solve for them. And we're going to do the exact same thing in this case. So uh, let me switch over to a new page. So what, what are the orthogonality relationships for sine and cosine? Basically, what, what, what do we get when we dot e1 with e2 for sine and cosine? Well, uh, this is what we get. We get that... The dot product, the dot product between two trig functions is the integral of the two basis functions multiplied together. So for instance, if we want to look at 
two two sines multiplied together, or or the dot product of two sines, then we would say that uh, this is this integral. And if you do this integral, um, and I, I in a previous video I, I evaluate this integral, uh, what you find is that this is equal to it's equal to pi if n is equal to m, but neither of these are zero. So 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 n is equal to m. And maybe we also say that n and m are, are greater than or equal to zero. So if n is equal to m and they're not both zero, then you get pi. Otherwise, you get zero. Uh, likewise, we can we can look at the dot product for our for our cosine terms. In that case, we have our, our dot product is cosine nx cosine mx dx, and this is equal to, well, it's equal to pi if n is equal to m, m is not equal to zero, so same as up here. It's equal to two pi if n equals m equals zero, and then it's equal to zero if n is not equal to m. And then lastly, so we have a lot of different combinations of basis vectors. The last one is if we combine basis vectors from sine and cosine. So integral minus pi to pi, sine of nx, cosine of mx, dx. And in this case, we always get zero. So sine and cosine are always orthogonal to each other. So just like in the linear algebra case, uh, we know that our sine and cosine functions are orthogonal. That is, that when we when we take combinations of them that aren't exactly the same. So that is, if we if we look at the case where n is not equal to m, we always get zero. Then what we do is we we proceed ahead and we do the exact same thing that we did in the linear algebra case. So so let's rewrite our four A series real quick. So we have f of x is equal to a0 plus a1 cosine of x plus a2 cosine of 2x plus dot 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 plus b1 sine of x plus b2 sine of 2x plus dot dot dot. If we want to isolate, say, this coefficient a1, then what do we do? Well, we do the exact same that we did in the linear algebra case. We multiply everything by cosine of x, and and we take the dot product. So, so what does that mean? That means that we we want to take the left hand side, and we'll take our f of x, multiply it by cosine of x, integrate it from minus pi to pi, and then we want to do the exact same thing with the right hand side. And so, that means integral minus pi to pi. And then we're going to have what we're going to have a0 plus a1 cosine of x plus um, you know, plus the rest of the cosine terms plus b1 sine of x plus the rest of the sine terms. All of this multiplied by cosine of x dx. And what happens? Well, we know that the integral of cosine x multiplied by any sine term over this interval is going to give us zero. So what that tells us is that all of these all of these sine terms are equal to zero. Likewise, we know that cosine multiplied by a different cosine integrated over this interval is only going to be non-zero when n is equal to m. So what that means is that this one term with cosine of x will, will, will give us something other than zero, but everything else goes to zero. So what does that leave us with? And that leaves us with integral minus pi to pi f of x cosine of x dx is equal to, then what do we have? We have a1 times integral minus pi to pi cosine squared x dx. And this integral right here, we, we can we can check what this is from up here. So in the case where n is equal to 1 and m is equal to 1, uh, that gives us pi. And so we, we can see then that a1 is equal to 1 over pi integral minus pi to pi f of x 
cosine of x dx. Excellent. And so, and we, we so we've done it um, for this uh, this coefficient in the series. We can solve for it. Uh, by doing the exact same thing that we did in linear algebra, where we take the dot product of both sides with this corresponding basis function. And we can do the exact same thing with sine. And so if we were to do the same thing with sine, what we would find is that, say, if we wanted to do b1, we would find that b1 is equal to uh, the same thing, 1 over pi, integral minus pi to pi, f of x times sine of x dx. And we see then that this is this is actually the, in the exact same form as the general expression that we found in linear algebra. So in, in the linear algebra case, what we found was that, and I'll, and I'll maybe write this up here, we found that for some vector v equal to a e1 plus b e2, this coefficient a was given by v dot e1 divided by e1 dot e1. And this is exactly what we're seeing down here, right? So in, in the Fourier series case, what we have is that, what we have is that a1 is equal to, well, this dot product between the function and the basis vector. So integral f of x times the basis function, cosine of x. So our dot product on top divided by uh, divided by the dot product between the basis function and itself. So in this case, that's the integral for minus pi to pi of cosine squared, uh, which in our case is pi. And so these two expressions are in fact exactly the same. The only difference is that uh, in the case for linear algebra, we're doing our dot product. And in the case for functions in Fourier series, our dot product is the integral of the two functions multiplied together on this integral, on, on this interval. And so some people, in fact, don't even call this the dot product. They call it the inner product. It's sort of like a generalization of the dot product. But we see how the mathematics behind how these two things work is exactly the same. And the process that we use in both cases is, in fact, exactly the same. And so we've done it. We, we started off by, by looking at linear algebra and looking at how we can expand vectors in terms of basis functions. And we've seen that we can do exactly the same thing for Fourier series. And that gives us, uh, that gives us our expression for our Fourier series. Now, uh, there are still a lot of unanswered questions that you may have. And so one is, one is why exactly uh, does the dot product between vectors correspond to this integral of two functions in the case for Fourier series? Likewise, you might be wondering, well, you know, what are the actual mathematical reasons for why this works? I mean, why is it that, you know, these 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 vectors, these little you know pointy arrows that we think of, have the exact same structure as what we see in Fourier series. You know what what's what, what's going on here? What's what's the deeper reason behind that? I'm going to get to all of these questions in some videos later on in this series. But uh, for now, in the next video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat this analysis. So look at a a similar situation, except in the case where uh, the basis functions are no longer orthogonal. So in this case. In this case, this whole time we assume that if we have two basis functions, e1 and e2, we, we, we assume for the whole time, and, and the basis behind how this method worked was the assumption that if we take the dot product between these two, we're always going to get zero. Um, but in fact, you don't even need to assume that. So in the next video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the case where our basis uh, vectors are something like this, something like 1, 0, and 1, 1. So we know that the dot product between these isn't going to be equal to zero, but we do know that these two functions or, or these two vectors, they're independent. So we, we know that we could express any, any, any vector v in terms of these two basis vectors, but they're not orthogonal. And so the question then is how, how can we go about developing some, some method, some formalism for expressing any vector v in terms of basis functions that aren't orthogonal? So in the next video, I'm going to go into that. So I, I hope this video has been helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below. Uh, and if you enjoyed this video, then please like and subscribe. And I hope to see you soon.